So maybe a few words about the speaker. Dimojin Karaja has received his master degree from Graz University of Technology. In 2018, he finished his PhD degree on the design of a Class D audio amplifier with a special focus on the electromagnetic compatibility. His background is mainly analog and mixed signal design. And in his previous positions, he has been working with NXP semiconductors and AMS. And he is currently with Infineon Technologies as a concept engineer for optical imaging and ranging detectors. So Dimogen, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure having you here. Yes, yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, also welcome from my side. I'm going to talk today about uh, 3D imaging um, and especially about indirect time of flight imaging. I'll come basically to all the terms later. Just short um, outlook on the agenda. What I'm going to talk about today is I will shortly introduce the time of flight principle and show some application examples. So basically, where is this technology used? Um, then I will go into detail on how this technology works and I will show some details on how uh, this is implemented on chip. And finally, I have two short chapters on how customers are, are using and how they are building then 3D cameras with our time of flight chips. Um, you may notice maybe if you I saw some some participants from Infineon also you may um, may have seen some of the slides here before. It's basically a collection um, of slides that are used within our um, design team, and many of these slides are coming from especially from Markus Dilacher and Martin Flatscher. Thanks to them. Um, but now I can start. <clears throat> so first of all. Um, there are different technologies how to do ranging. Ranging means to measure distance, basically. Uh, and here in, at Infineon, we currently have um, or really work on two ranging technologies. One are optical ranging technologies and, and on the other side, radar, radar ranging technologies. Um, on the optical, I'm working on the optical side and here um, we, fall, we basically use um, active technologies. That means um, all our 3D or ranging technologies, they use active light that is sent out to illuminate the scene. Um, and then uh, this back reflected light from the scene is used to analyze the distance of the objects in the scene. Um, quite widely, also passive technologies are used. For instance, um, two standard RGB cameras are used in parallel to detect the distance. But here in Finian, we currently follow mainly the active technologies, especially the time of flight technology. Um, there are two types of time of flight technologies. One are flash illumination technologies and one are scanning technologies. So the flash technologies basically there um, we illuminate the scene with a flash of light. So the whole scene is illuminated at once and then the back reflected light is analyzed. And then there are also scanning technologies where basically the scene is illuminated only in a, in a small dot, for instance, and that dot is then scanned across the scene to capture the complete scene. Um, and then when it comes to the receiver, there is indirect TOF and direct TOF. Let's start with the direct TOF. So basically direct TOF, direct time of flight means that um, we send out a certain light pulse and then directly measure the time until this right light pulse is reflected to this from the scene back to our um, 3D device. So basically the, the time which the light takes to travel to an object and be and to be reflected back, exactly this time is measured. So it's really directly the time of flight is measured. Um, the second option, how to do the, the distance estimation is basically that not the time is measured directly, but it's measured indirectly. Here, basically the emitted light is modulated. That's this black wave. 
and then the backscattered light from the scene is measured. And due to, to this modulation, um, the 3D device measures uh, the time shift between the emitted light and the backscattered light. And the time shift is measured as a phase phase shift, you could say. So it's not a single, not the, the, the time of light of a single pulse is analyzed, but um, over some time, a modulated light is emitted, and then um, the phase shift is analyzed for some time. Um, I am currently working on indirect time of flight methods and devices using this principle. And this talk is mainly about indirect time of flight ranging. Maybe let's start with some history. There was a very early experiment of a French uh, physician, Hippolyte Fuseau, and um, he used the time of flight principle to measure the speed of light. So back then it was not known how, how fast the light actually travels. And he created an experiment which is based on an idea of Galileo Galilei um, to measure the time of uh, to measure the speed of light using the time of flight. And what he did is basically he had a light source and he had a semi-transparent uh, mirror. And this light source uh, he directed to the mirror and this semi-transparent mirror um, reflected the light through a rotating strobe disk. Um, and then the light traveled to a mirror, was reflected back from the mirror again through the rotating disk, through the semi-transparent mirror into the eye of the observer. And then basically, um, Polite Fizeau adjusted the rotation speed of this rotating disk um, until all the reflected light that was coming back from the mirror would always hit the tooth of the strobe disk. So that um, the strobe disk was so fast that it's exactly within the time of light, it would move one tooth forward so that the light could travel through in one direction, but not come back. And by knowing this, the rotation speed of this strobe disk, he then basically knew the time of flight, the time that light needed to go to the mirror and back. And then he could calculate the, the speed of light. This is a, let's say, more original drawing of his experiment. So this was the rotating uh, strobe disk. This was the mirror. It was placed, I think, 8.6 kilometers away. And then he could measure the speed of light with this. Unfortunately, he had made a mistake of about 5%. Um, nowadays, it's believed that this error was coming from the fact that he couldn't determine the rotation speed of this disk with uh, sufficient accuracy. However, um, he here used time of flight to measure the speed of light. And nowadays we exactly know the speed of light, and but we don't know the distance. So basically we still use the same principle, but with a different variable that we want to determine. This is more or less um, how a 3D indirect time of light camera would look like. Um, in the center, we have basically our, um, our indirect time of light chip that consists more or less of many pixels. So a real array of pixels that can measure the time of flight. What we do is this chip has an external light source I wrote here Vixel, I will come to that later. It's a special laser diode, which is typically used. So our chip controls also the external illumination source. And what he does is he controls the external illumination source in a way that modulated light is sent out. So here we typically use on-off modulation because it's just the easiest way to implement the modulated light. And this light is then basically illuminated to the scene and hit some object in the scene, the scene will reflect back the light. And what the chip does is back basically in every single of these pixels, it measures the phase shift between the illuminated and the reflected back signal. 
So this phase shift here is measured. And then afterwards, this data is sent to a processing unit. So quite powerful processing is needed here. For instance, uh, FPGAs or similar things are used. <clears throat> Basically, what this processing unit gets is the is data to calculate this phase shift. And from this phase shift, knowing the speed of light, it can then calculate the distance or the depth. You then basically get an image like this. This is a false color image, meaning, for instance, blue is far away and red is quite near. And you then basically get an image of the scene um, showing the distance uh, of the object in the scene. Uh, what you also get, or what can be calculated from this data, is an amplitude image. This is basically showing how much light came back from the scene. So it's more or less a measure how reflective the objects in the scene are. And if you look at it, it looks quite like a grayscale image. Um, even so, it's not a grayscale image, but um, it's quite easy then to use this to identify the objects that you have there because it's quite easy to, to view it with a human eye. What you can see here, for instance, is the eyes of this person, they are not very reflective. That's why they uh, appear so dark, whereas the hand, which is quite near to the camera, is very reflective and is near. So a lot of light comes back here, and that's why it's so uh, light. <clears throat> um, these pixel arrays then really create like a depth image, like an RGB image, but in depth. Um, state of the art today is something is typically um, is up to VGA resolution. That's uh, 300,000 pixels more or less. But already now in publications and also in some products, we even see a higher resolution, 0.6 megapixels up to one megapixel. So where is this technology used? I have to admit that the main use case today is face authentication. So basically in all the cell phones where you can do face authentication, you have some time of flight chip in here um, that basically scans your face to identify, is it a flat image or is it a face? Um, what is also used someday sometimes is on the back side of the phone, uh, basically uh, world facing, um, basically to enhance, uh, for instance, to enhance images or to do some um, computational photography and, and similar things. Another topic is of course virtual reality, um, where you can basically use this technology to include um, your surrounding into the virtual uh, scene that you're seeing through your uh, through your goggles. I'm personally currently working in automotive environment. So here a big topic is um, in-cabin sensing. So for instance, you have such a 3D camera in the roof module of your car. And this can then uh, analyze, um, for instance, how far is the driver away? Is there a person sitting or is it some different thing? Uh, one application for this is, for instance, um, or could be uh, adaptive airbag employment. So, um, because you now with this camera, you know how far the driver is away, and therefore you can um, basically, in in the in in the case of a crash, you can then activate uh, the airbag in a way that it is fit that it fits to the to the driver position. So. For instance, um, activate it a little earlier that it inflates completely if the person is farther away or activate it a little um, later if the person is sitting very near, for instance. Um, and another topic where this is quite widely used currently is robotics, especially household robotics, uh, where, for instance, these cleaning robots, some of them already have a time of flight camera um, to basically to understand its surrounding and to, to, to detect um, obstacles in, in their very way. So how does this technology actually work? Um, each pixel in, in, the, in the pixel array is, 
is a photon mixing device. At least that's how we call it at Infineon. Photon mixing device. It basically looks like this. Um, each pixel looks like this. You have two readout nodes. They are basically two diodes, a diode A and a diode B. And you have some modulation gates, a modulation gate A and B. Um, and this device is basically used to detect the phase of the back reflected light. And it works like this. When light hits the chip, basically it enters uh, the silicon and it generates charge separation. So suddenly a lot of electrons are freed due to the energy that is that that is um, that is hit in or that is absorbed in the silicon. And what we now can do with these two modulation gates, modulation gate A and B, is that we can steer the electric field within the chip. So basically, for instance, by applying a positive charge to this gate and a negative charge to this gate, we can create an electric field that sucks all these generated electrons to one side of the pixel. Of course, this doesn't work perfectly. Some electrons will also go to the other side, but majority of the electrons then go to one side where, it is called, where they are collected. Um, they are collected in these readout nodes. And in case we just invert the potential, so apply a positive potential here, the electrons go to the other side. And this principle is used to detect the phase of the uh, backscattered light. Um, what you can see here are, for instance, these um, electric signals on the two modulation gates. So what you see here, mod A, mod B, is basically the electric voltage on this node and on this node. Um, we apply these signals also always in an exactly inverted shape. So if the modulation gate A is applied with a high voltage, the gate B is applied with, to a low voltage and so on. It's always inverted. So that's why I will in, in, in the oncoming minutes, I will show it just like this. This is A, green is all the electrons go to A and this uh, reddish color is uh, modulation signal is applied to B. So all the electrons are collected on the B readout node. And then we apply these signals to every single pixel in the pixel array and then we start emitting light. So basically we have an external light source that we control and we control it in a way that basically we send out light always at the same phase as we have, uh, the, as we have the electric signal on A. So basically it's always in phase with the sensor, so with the pixel array signal. This light is sent out, it goes to the scene, and some objects in the scene will reflect this light, and the reflected light will come back sometime later due to the time of flight. This light that comes back from the scene will then generate electrons inside this photon mixing device, and whenever A is high, these electrons will go to the readout node A, and whenever B is high, these electrons will go to the readout node B. So I will just now show what happens on A. Typically, we charge the readout node A first to a certain voltage. And then at all of these instances, we collect electrons, meaning we discharge this node. The same happens for the readout node B. At these times, we collect the electrons. So basically, B is charged at the beginning. And exactly at these times, we collect the electrons that are generated by the reflected light. And this causes the node to be discharged. And then in the end, we basically have a voltage, a differential voltage between these two nodes. And this differential voltage is linearly, linearly dependent basically on this time of flight. Or if we look at this complete wave, we can say it's a certain phase shift of this waveform. How fast do we do this? So a typical frequency to modulate this is for instance, 100 megahertz. So basically this voltage here then corresponds to a certain phase shift between the emitted 100 megahertz waveform 
and the received 100 megahertz light. So at the end, we then always read out with an ADC this differential voltage, and we do this for every single pixel on the pixel array. What you see here is, for instance, uh, is basically the characteristic of this voltage. Um, what you see here on the y-axis is the voltage that we read out, so this differential voltage between readout node A and B. On the x-axis, I have plotted the phase shift. So basically, zero means the reflected light is has um, did not have any time of flight, so it was basically zero distance. This time, light didn't travel due to a very near object. object. And then when the objects move farther away, we get basically this phase shift up to a complete period of the 100 megahertz. That would be three meters. So that's why this phase shift here is basically equivalent to distance. So very close objects have a certain voltage, which is, for instance, very negative if we measure B minus A by uh, B to A voltage. And then at some point, all the electrons are collected in the other bucket. And then again, at another point, all the electrons are collected in the other readout node. And in between, we have basically this linear change of the voltage. Especially at these points, this means that we have exactly um, a time of flight where half of the electrons are collected in A and half are collected in B. So let's say we read out now a certain voltage. Let's say we read out exactly this voltage here. What would that mean? It could be that object has exactly this distance here, or that the object has exactly this distance here. We don't know it, it's ambiguous. And that's why we typically do a trick. Um, we then do the light to a second um, measurement, more or less, but we shift. Um, we shift the emitted light by 90 degree. So the first measurement was, it's exactly in phase with this signal, and now we shift it by 90 degree. And this basically causes uh, that the characteristic of the sensor changes. Now, at exactly, if the emitted light comes back immediately, we exactly have zero volt. And then at some sh phase shift, basically when this has moved to here, we get all the electrons in, in one side and then here again on the other side. But now we have basically a second readout. And this second readout will, for instance, give this value. And then we know, uh -huh, we are at this distance and not at this distance. And that's why in, in indirect time of flight cameras, we at least need two readouts or let's say two measurements of the scene to determine the the, um, the distance of the objects in the scene. Because without this, we wouldn't know on which side um, of this ambiguous we are. Now, how does the data look actually? And how do we process that? So, this A0 is basically the, for every single pixel, the readout, the voltage readout for this measurement without phase shift. And the A1 is the measured value with 90 degree phase shift. And then just using an Arcus Tangens function, we can basically calculate um, the, the phase shift that we have seen. Uh, just as an information, phase shift is here more or less um, uh, treated like distance because you can calculate from phase shift to distance quite quite easily knowing the speed of light and the modulation frequency that you do have used so basically um, i said typically 100 megahertz are used for this on off keying or on off modulation of the light what you see here is then basically a plot of this phase for every single pixel and it more or less, it shows the distance. So some objects are behind, some are at the front, and the, the background is quite far away. Again, in, displayed in force color uh, image. The second thing, which I have already uh, mentioned before, is 
that we can collate, uh, calculate the amplitude image. So basically, uh, with this formula, we calculate the amplitude of the backscattered light. Um, and it gives this nice grayscale like looking image, which basically shows uh, the reflectivity of the objects in the scene. Um, and it's quite easy to see what this is. It's just some boxes piled up. However, what you can maybe see, I'm not sure if you can see that on your screens, are these nasty stripes through the image here. And here in the distance image, you also see the stripes. And then um, those, let's say, those surfaces, which should be rather flat, they don't look flat. So we have, it looks like noise in here. Um, it's not a uniform, uh, it, it's not really, has not the same color, meaning the distance is not really uniform. These are artifacts of our um, readout system, the stripes and also these these, for instance, these black uh, red dots in here. Um, and the question is now how to remove these artifacts. Uh, one reason, for instance, for these artifacts, especially here for the stripes, are offsets in the readout chain. What we can see here, for instance, is that this pixel array is read out column by column. And each column basically has a different readout circuit and a different ADC that converts the voltage. And this basically causes in each column a different offset because all of these circuits due to um, process deviations and local mismatch and so on have a different offset. So each column readout has a different offset and that's why you get these stripes in. And now um, we use a, a third trick basically to get out these artifacts. What we actually do is, I explained this before, we do one image where the light has no phase shift, one image where the light has 90 degree phase shift, and then we do two more images, one where the light has 180 degree phase shift, and one where the light has 270 degree phase shift. So we do basically four illuminations and four measurements of the scene. Why do we do this? Basically to get out all these artifacts. Um, if you look at this, the A0 and the A2, what will happen here? The light is just shifted by 180 degree. So basically, if all the electrons that come back are collected here in bucket A, then they will appear here now in bucket B. Meaning the A0 and the A2, the voltage that we get out will have some symmetry. It will just be inverted. And this property, we now use in the following way. This is what I just have just explained. So the A2 is the 180 degree and the A0 is the zero. They will just be the voltage that we read out will just be inverted because the phase shift is just shifted by half period. The same for A3, the 90 degree and the 270 degree. So the formula for the phase shift, which I've shown before has just slightly changed. But in the end, if we apply the symmetry properties, we are get out more or less the same formula again. It's the same phase shift. We can cancel out these twos. But then for the offset, if we apply a certain offset to each of these readings, due to these um, four measurements, also the offset cancels out. This is also true for linear gain errors. However, linear gain errors would already cancel out in, in a two-phase measurement. However, mainly for the offset, we do these four phase measurements. There are some more effects that cancel out, but I will not go into detail here. And then by using four phases to calculate the image, basically with these two formulas, we get much nicer images. As you can see here in the amplitude image, basically all the stripes are more or less gone. Also here in the distance image, uh, the flat surfaces, they appear much more uniform because yeah, offsets are gone and some, some other effects are also canceled out now. Okay, so this is how the technology actually works. We have um, a photon mixing device that basically um, demodulates the phase of the backscattered light. And such a photon mixing device is 
inside of every of these pixels. As said before, VGA resolution like 640 by 480 pixel is, is currently state of the art. Um, and each of these now delivers one point such we get these nice depth maps. How big are these pixels typically? They are yeah, about, mm, yeah, I would say state of the art is something like five by five micrometer. But uh, we also see uh, a lot of pixels currently with 10 by 10, which are sold quite well in publications. We now see much smaller pixels, um, 3.5 micron to 3.5 micron that direction. Um, I will now go a little more into circuit design, how these pixels are actually looking like and what electronics are needed there. Ah, yeah, this is one thing I wanted to show, maybe complementary to last slide. I took this from a, a market report, more or less, on the x-axis, you see the, the timeline, so until about summer this year, and here you see the resolution. Um, let's focus on the brown dots here. These are basically the indirect time of flight images, uh, devices. And here the resolution that we see is typically yeah, 100,000 pixels up to 0 0.6 megapixels. Um, what do we have here in the market? Sony is a big player in the, yeah, I think this is QVGA, this is VGA resolution, um, Infineon is selling its devices with together with their um, with their um, let's say corporate company cooperating company PMD so these are basically the Infineon devices um, it's going towards the one megapixel direction I would say um, but already here I think is currently a state of art like VGA that's GA is somewhere here and it's 6 0 0.6 megapixels. Um, how do these pixels actually look like? You can see here, so basically when you take such a chip and look at it with a microscope, you will see something like this. Um, this is basically on top of the chip, it's a micro lens that you see here. And this micro lens is used to focus the light into the optical area of the chip, uh, of, of the pixel. So basically, underneath this micro lens, you can then see a circuit like this with a big part, hopefully, which is optical area. And the micro lens is, is edged in a way that the light is actually uh, focused into this area here. I will later on show some more cross sections of micro lenses, but it's basically state of art that uh, in all the time of flight sensors, you have um, this micro lens on top to improve the performance. Then you typically have this optical area. Not sure if you can read this, but here these two stripes are poly lines, which are the modulation gate A and the modulation gate B, which are used to do this uh, modulation either to collect the electrons on one side or the other. Then basically here, is some control electronics which are used to um, basically to bring the pixel into a defined state at the beginning of the measurement and then to read out the signal afterwards. Um, and then we have here another block, uh, it's called SBI, which means suppression of background illumination. I will come to that later. Um, this is a quite Infineon specific thing. Um, our pixels have a circuit to suppress background illumination. Um, the other thing, basically this control logic here, um, there are not so many pixel variants actually, and most of the um, most of our competitors also use some kind of very similar circuit here to control the pixel. Um, for background uh, light suppression, some competitors have similar circuits and some you don't use this. 
But now let's go into detail, especially what does this control circuit does. Um, I will, from now on, I will only show one half of this control signal. So maybe if only for the B side, because the other side is just symmetric. And here, this readout node, I will show just as a diode because basically it's an NP junction. So I will just draw it as a diode. What does this control circuit do? So this is a simplified version of the circuit that we have seen. It has, I have replaced the, um, the transistors now with switches. It has two, three switches actually. One is here the reset switch, one is the hold switch, and one is a select switch. The photo, one half of the photo mixing device, I have as said, drawn as a photodiode. And I have also drawn here a capacitor. This can either be an explicit capacitor or is, is designed as more or less parasitic capacitance. And in the first phase, this is before we do the measurement, we bring all pixels to a well-defined state. We charge them to a certain reset voltage. This is done by closing this and this switch. And then this capacitor here is charged to the reset voltage. And then basically we start the modulation and we start illuminating the scene with the modulated light. And the modulation is started by opening this reset switch. So the, the pixel is now no longer pre-charged. Only this voltage here on this capacitor is defining the state of the pixel. And then due to this uh, modulation at the incoming light, we collect some electrons here. And these electrons basically discharge the capacitor here. So the voltage just goes down linearly with the collected electrons. And then at some point we say we want to stop the distance measurement now. And this is done based in our pixels globally, in every single pixel, this whole switch is opened. And this photodiode can then no longer discharge the capacitor. So basically this, the charge is then stored in the capacitor, giving out a defined voltage. And then we go through the pixel array and gradually from one pixel to the next, we close this select switch such that basically this uh, source for this is source follower can then give out the, the voltage. And then via some buffer stages, an ADC is connected to the end, which um, converts this voltage to a um, digital value. This is how the control of these pixels work. And then we have this SPI circuit, the suppression of background illumination. This is basically a circuit um to help that helps us to operate in very light conditions because we illuminate the scene and we want uh, as much as possible uh, as much light as possible to come back to our imager um, but of course we'll not only get the light which we have eliminated we'll also get light from for instance sunlight or light from from your light in the room and this light does not contribute to our signal but it's still this charge is basically the two capacitors, which are not drawn here. It's here on the hold nodes. These two are also discharged by this light. However, um, both of these capacitors are discharged, mainly because uh, half of the time, basically uh, half of the time, uh, the electrons from the sunlight are come going to, to this node and half of the time to this node. So basically the sunlight discharges both nodes um, with the same slope. However, this causes the, um, the capacitor to be discharged until we reach some saturation border. And after that, we could no longer um, measure anything. So this basically causes um, um, or has the effect that under strong sunlight, um, we will saturate our pixel array and we can then not make any uh, distance measurement. And that's why this circuit here is introduced. Basically, we measure the voltage at these two hold nodes. And once, if one of these two voltages hits, the, hits a certain lower border, we start activating these current sources. And these current sources just 
generates just the current which actually compensates the sunlight. Moreover, it generates exactly the current that this node stays at the constant potential. Basically, this causes, this, this has the effect that um, one node then stays exactly at that threshold and all the differential signal from that point on is then collected in, um, in the second node. So basically, in, in this way, uh, with this circuit, we have a way to significantly increase our dynamic range when we have a strong backlight. Here is a small simulation of one of my colleagues. Um, in the first line here, you see basically a pixel without this SPI circuit. And in the bottom, you see a pixel with our SPI circuit. Then let's consider this case here where we have no background light. Uh, if we have no background light, um, the, the pixel, so the pixel may be integrated to some, um, to some lower threshold or uh, to some lower saturation uh, voltage just because there is a very reflective object in the scene. And, and then this pixel cannot be used to, to, um, to generate distance data from that point. However, when you have an SPI circuit, basically um, all the, uh, this node will be held constant and then all the signal will be accumulated just in the second node. So basically we have some more dynamic range here then until it saturates again on the upper border. Uh, and this helps us to also detect very reflective objects. And then within, when we have strong sunlight, we see the sunlight um, just adds a second, basically down integration slope to both sides. So both sides then integrate down very fast because there is a strong light source that generates electrons which contribute to both sides. And with the SPI, uh, basically at the moment where we hit the lower threshold, then um, we, we can basically accumulate the signal um, in the second side um, until we saturate here. So we significantly then prolong our or increase our dynamic range. My colleague has also made a simulation here. So here we see the distance of the object on one axis and the background light on the other axis. Background light or sunlight is here given here in kilo lux. Um, lux is or has become kind of the, um, the standard way of how to give background light, even so I'm not very happy with it. Um, this looks because it's, um, Lux is basically a measure for the, the, the power of the light, uh, per area, but multiplied with the, um, sensitivity curve of the human eye. So it's a, let's say, not very easy to use unit, but still it has, I think, become the standard industry, so industry unit. Uh, zero kilolux is then dark. 100 kilolux is more or less really bright sunlight on a, on a nice day without clouds. And something like 10 kilolux is maybe just normal indoor light. Um, and with what we see here, the yellow one is the saturation. So um, without, if we would not have any SPI, basically we would saturate from 30 kilowatts onwards, we will always be saturated. While with this circuit, we can then basically use this range here also for distance measurement and are then um, capable to operate also in very bright sunlight. Um, there is also some, some dependency on the distance as said, very bright objects, uh, will also lead to a saturation. Um, that's why here is also some saturation for very close, very bright objects. However, the SPI is, is really a beneficial circuit, uh, that makes us capable to, to operate in, in outdoor applications, for instance. Then. Let's come to the next topic. This is a topic which is it's actually a very complex topic and I just want to briefly mention it because um, I will relate to it a little later. Um, what we want to measure is uh, the phase shift of the, of the 
our signal with a very high signal to noise ratio because the higher the signal to noise ratio is the better confidence basically we have on the on the distance or the, the less distance noise we see then in our picture and there are quite some noise sources inside our circuit um, which reduce our signal to noise ratio um, I've just mentioned the most prominent ones here because uh, if you work or if you come to work in this area I think they will they will hit you first maybe um, the most important here is um, uh, KT over C noise because basically as you've seen we are storing charge in a capacitor and then we measure the voltage on that capacitor and, and that's a classic switch capacitor circuit which is always uh, suffering from KT over C noise so this noise um, is somehow um, uh, dependent on the square root of KT over C so K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, and C is this storage capacitor. So <clears throat> this is in many cases the limiting factor for, for measurements in the dark. Because in the dark, this is the main um, noise source. And how well you can control your KT, KT over C noise, or how well you did the design there or the optimization, uh, the better you will uh, you will have uh, the better images basically you will make in the dark. Uh, this is also a main design trait of for the design of these pixels. And basically the first point you will come across when designing such pixels. Second thing is um, what we call photon shot noise. Um, what basically is the reason behind this is that the, the light I, I look at them now as quantized photons. So the quantized photons, they come in, but they don't come in uniformly. They come in, let's say, with a with a random nature, so the time when they come in and when they generate the electrons. And this randomness can be modeled with a Poisson process. Um, and this generates noise. This is somehow strange. The noise which is generated is um, related to the square root of the generated electrons. So the more light comes in, the more noise is generated. And now it depends a lot um, what light this is. Because if this is the light that you have illuminated, and when a lot of this light comes back, you generate also a lot of noise. But the noise only grows with the square root of the generated electrons, your signal um, increases with the number of generated electrons. So basically, signal of noise ratio becomes better. However, when we look at sunlight, the sunlight that comes back or that comes into your chip, it does not uh, contribute to your signal. So it basically just generates noise. And that's why basically this photon shot noise is the limiting factor in in all um, all areas where you have a lot of background light so if, for instance in outdoor applications this is really the limiting factor and um, a lot of effort is put into um, to design of basically of the module then such that the module will not collect too much uh, background light i will come to that a little bit later and finally of course we call it readout noise. It's basically all the noise that is added by uh, by the circuits. You need to read out the capacitor voltages. So, for instance, buffers, ADCs, and so on. So you really need to properly address these kind of noise source, noise sources because otherwise they might become the dominant sources in your system. So finally, before end of discussion of pixels. Um, let me give you a short overview of the technology which is used. When we talk about um, time of flight technologies, there are two, let's say, uh, two, two, uh, uh, one really big separation between two technologies. One technology is the front side illuminated technology, and one is the back side illuminated technology. Um, the front side technologies, they are more or less. Uh, based on standard CMOS processes. So you have your substrate, you do some doping to generate these photodiodes, and then you have a metal stack above this to connect all your devices. 
And then on top, and this is now specific to, let's say, an optic process, um, um, a photo, uh, sorry, a micro lens is etched. And this micro lens really helps you to collect all the lights in the photodiode, so the photoactive area. This is the front side illuminated process. And then we have back side illuminated process. What is done here, it's also again a process where you have the substrate and then the photodiode, you do your metal wiring on top. But then afterwards, after the processing of this, the substrate is grinded down until it is really thin. So these photodiodes are sometimes three to 10 micrometers just thin. Of course, it's very, very complicated to grind down a wafer in a controlled way so that the complete wafer is done just 10 micrometer thin. Then afterwards, you apply micro lenses to the back side of the chip on, and, you, and the light will afterwards enter the chip from this side and generate the electrons here. Of course, this front side illuminated process is much cheaper and has like lower complexity. Um, and this process is, of course, uh, a little more complex because you have this additional grinding process and then afterwards the micro lens etching. So this is more expensive. However, the big benefit of this backside illuminated process is that basically what you can see here is that when the light comes in, there is this metal wiring that's kind of shielding the light from the optical area. So a lot of the light will not reach the optical area, but will just be reflected here by the metal. This will not happen in the backside illuminated process because here all the light can enter into the optical area. Um, and there is no obstacle in the way. So basically this process allows a higher quantum efficiency. Quantum efficiency basically means um, how many of the incoming photons will actually create electrons. So quantum efficiency of one means every incoming electron uh, photon creates electrons and the quantum efficiency of zero means, yeah, no electrons are generated. Of course, you want a high as much quantum efficiency uh, because then just more light that is coming in is generating electrons. And that's then you have a higher signal, basically, a higher signal level compared to your noise sources. There is one small uh, benefit of, of this technology here. Um, as you have seen in the photo mixing device, we need to demodulate the incoming light. So we need to basically to collect or to separate the electrons to electrons that go to one readout nodes and electrons that go to the other readout node. And as basically the light is entering here, of course, most electrons will also be generated here on the surface. And the electric field is also here on the surface. So basically this demodulation is typically better in this process. Um, and the second thing is crosstalk because the light that has entered here and has passed this basically this kind of channel down between the metal wires is quite straight. So the light will mainly go here and will not go to the other pixel. Um, and that's then you don't have crosstalk between the pixels. Here, it could easily happen that the light goes uh, to the next pixel and then you have kind of like blooming effects in the image so that one object um, has a very bright halo around itself because basically here crosstalk has happened. But um, let me say this clearly, this is just, let's say the theoretical approach that this year, this technology has higher devolution contrast and this year has higher quantum efficiency. Um, there are many, let's say process uh, options that you can do to improve the different parameters. I'm not an expert here, but I'm always amazed what, what um, people can actually, or what our technology colleagues can actually do here. So let me show you one example. Um, my colleagues published this this year in S in the SCIR conference. What you see here is basically the cross section through such a front side illuminated pixel. Here on top is the micro lens. Then here is this metal stack. And here is then the photodiode. Why is this micro lens not exactly on top of the photodiode? 
This is because this cross section is the cross section from a pixel, which is not exactly in the center of the array, but is somewhere more to the edge of the array. Um, so that lights will anyway always come with a certain angle. And this we try to compensate by placing the micro lens somehow offset such that the focusing effect is really into the, into the pixel. And what my colleagues have, um, have introduced here to improve basically the performance. The first thing is uh, this prisma here, which acts like a mirror that mirrors um, the, the incoming light really exactly through this, this narrow channel of metallization that the metallization leaves through this channel into the photodiode. Of course, um, every single of these prismas is different for each pixels, for each pixel. Um, because for this pixel, the light will mainly come from here. This pixel will already have a different angle and so on. So all the prismas also have to be different. This is, I think, quite a big achievement to, to process this in a way that these prismas really work um, to improve the performance and really guide the light through this channel into it. Because without this prisma, the light would just go like to this edge here, maybe here a little bit. Um, but a lot of it would just be reflected here on the metal layers. The second thing they introduced, for instance, is here down. They introduced small cavities within the substrate. And these cavities act as a mirror for the light. So that light that goes down here is mirrored back again. Um, why do we do this? Because not all the light that travels down here actually generates electrons. But by mirroring back, we just generate a longer path for the light to stay within the photodiode. And thereby, it's just the chance increases a lot that electrons are generated. And then another interesting thing they can do is that they create these really buried trenches here, which also kind of act like a mirror, such that um, the light does not go to the next pixel and generate crosstalk between pixels. So there is quite a lot still that you can do within um, within your process. Even so, if you have, for instance, settled on a C on the front side illuminated process. But going back here, what uh, what really has to be said is that the front side illuminated process, even if you apply these let's let me call it tricks or improvements, um, has quite big limitations. So especially when pixels are shrinked down to smaller dimensions in order to create a higher resolution, um, there is no way around going the, to the backside illuminated process. And so basically today, um, all the smaller pixel nodes, like five micrometer or smaller, they all um, are built on a backside illuminated process because only here you can actually um, achieve sufficient performance. Good. I've talked now a lot about pixels. What is what is there on the chip uh, apart from pixels? So this here is a, a photograph of the of an um, Infineon time of flight chip. Here is the pixel array, um, and there are a lot uh, some other different blocks as well. So here, for instance, is a big block which is it's the ADCs. So they are used to basically convert then the information of each single pixel into a digital word. Um, each company has, say, a different approach how to realize this, uh, AD, this, this ADC conversion. Some companies rather go to a, to a very high number of ADCs, which operate uh, quite slow. Um, our approach here is that we have a quite small number of ADCs, for instance, just 16 here to convert then the 100,000 plus pixel values. But this small number of ADCs, for instance, is operated in a very fast manner. So we typically have a throughput and this chip, we had one of about um, more than one gigabit per second. Um, in the end, I have to admit, um, our um, 
competitors on the market which use a bigger number of ADCs, uh, they achieve very similar readout times for their pixel arrays as we have, and also very similar um, power consumption. So in the end, I think it's it's also a kind of um, um, whether you go to a very big number of ADCs which operate slower or a small number of ADCs which have a very high throughput. Um, it's also a little bit of I think background of the of the company experience they have and so on because it seems that both solutions um, are quite competitive. Then we have a big digital core down here. This digital core uh, basically controls all these ADCs. It controls basically all the, the signals, the control signals of the sensor core. So all these measurement phases. Um, and it controls the different analog parts here. Then it also has a very big uh, data storage because basically a lot of data is generated by these ADCs, which has to be buffered first before it goes then out of the chip. Um, for communication outside, we typically use the camera serial interface. This is a standardized interface, which is also used in RGB cameras. Uh, and that is more or less uh, industry standard to use this for, for image sensors. And what you can see here is, here is basically a PLL. So basically here we generate the frequency for our digital blocks, uh, but also the frequency uh, for modulation of the light. Um, this has to be highly stable frequency because basically it's, uh, if this is not stable, then also the distance measurement is, is uh, corrupted. Here we have one block. I will come to that a little later. Um, this is an, let's say, more or less Infineon specific block. We offer here some eye safety support functions. Uh, then we have a big block here that basically then generates uh, this modulation signal, so speci especially this synchronization that the, the illumination has, for instance, exactly 90 degree phase shift or exactly 45 degree phase shift or exactly 180, whatever you need. This is generated here. We have some analog interface mainly for test and self-diagnostics and so on, some control interfaces and one big block to generate all the needed uh, supply voltages on chip. So basically this chip is then produced and how is it, how do the customers get this chip from us? From, our, from us? Um, typically we distribute the time of flight chips uh, in two ways. The first is bare die. So the customers really just get this piece of silicon. Um, they then glue it to their PCB and then they really directly bond here from the pads on the outside of the chip with a small wire down to their PCB. This delivery here is highly preferred by all the consumer colleagues, uh, consumer customers like cell phone, cell phone manufacturers and so on, because um, in the end it allows lowest cost um, and is very beneficial then for high volume products. On the other side, we have uh, packaged time of flight chips. Um, what is special here, I think there are not too many on the market actually. I think there's just the Infineon and the Melexis chip, which, which offer a package. Um, but the reason here is that it's quite difficult to, to manufacture such a package. It's more or less a package with an optical window here to, to let in the light. Um, and I have been involved in the development of, of one package for Infineon now. And I have to admit, it's it's really very complicated. So the development costs of such a package are at least the same of the chip, even higher. It's very difficult to generate or uh, to, to manufacture such a package, such that this package is also robust and reliable. Because basically, you have here the glass, which is a very, very stiff object. And on the outside, you typically have plastic, some kind of plastic, which is not so stiff. And during, especially during temperature uh, cycles, so you operate, it heats up, uh, then you switch off, it cools down again during these temperature cycles over many years of lifetimes. Um, it's these chips, they start to get cracks or some kind of delaminations. So 
bringing up the process to manufacture such chips, such packages is very difficult. Um, and that's, I think, um, why there are not many on the market and why, of course, we have to sell these products at a much higher price than the bare die chips because the package is just really expensive, especially expensive in terms of development costs. However, these products are highly preferred by automotive customers who really value then afterwards the improved uh, robustness of these products. Because of course here, um, the chip is really bare die, so anything that falls on it, like dust or other things, uh, will affect the chip. And here you have this chip sealed in a nice, uh, completely sealed kind of uh, yeah, package, just makes the product much more robust. However, just buying this chip is not sufficient then to build a 3D camera. What the customers then additionally need is, is displayed here. So they buy our chip, then they have to build basically a driver that can drive the light source. We just provide a control signal and then an external driver is needed to drive the, the light that is illuminating the, the scene. Um, just some, some typical values here. This is um, a quite high power driver that is needed. So for instance, we have to switch something like six ampere peak currents with 100 megahertz and rise and fall times of less than one nanosecond. At least that's the goal. So these are really high power drivers that are, uh, that are then needed from our customers also to be put on the PCB. Then we have the light source. Um, Today, there is typically used a vertical cavity surface emitting laser diode for this. So it's basically a laser diode where the laser light comes out perpendicular to the surface of the chip. These are very powerful lasers, actually very small, but powerful. Um, and this, the big benefit of them is because they are so small, um, they can be built together with the driver very in a very close proximity and, and then generate the really very clean on off pulses of the light. On top of the laser diode, a diffuser is placed and this diffuser basically then distributes the light uniformly to the scene that you want to illuminate. So with a certain field of view, for instance, 60 degree distribution to the scene to really create a very uniform lighting of, lighting of the scene. The light that goes to the scene is reflected and comes back. And then basically the customers put a lens on top of, the, of our chip. This lens focuses the light exactly on the pixel array. Um, and next to the lens, um, an optical filter is placed. Um, it just lets through the light, which is emitted by the laser diode. I will come to that on the next slide. And after the optical filter, again, we have the chip. So we do the distance measurement and then provide the data via this DeFi bus. So DeFi is the physical layer and CSI2, the camera serial interface is then the data layer of it. Um, very important thing is this optical filter here. Let me briefly talk about this one. What you see here is on the X axis, I have drawn the wavelengths of the light. On the Y axis, I have drawn basically the, the light power per area. And the red curve here is basically spectrum of sunlight. So uh, sunlight has some ultraviolet light and a lot of infrared light. The blue curve here shows the luminosity curve, so basically sensitivity of your eye. Um, what kind of laser diodes do we use? Um, currently, there are basically two types of laser diodes used. Um, laser diodes that emit light at 850 nanometer and 940 nanometer. As you can see, they are outside the optical range of your eye. One of the main reasons here is, of course, um, you do face ID with the time of flight sensor and you don't want 
uh, to see the light coming out there of the camera. So it's not visible, um, it's infrared. The, the, uh, yeah. Now we then use basically, as explained before, optical filters. I've just sketched them here. So for instance, they have a certain broadness, I don't know, plus minus 50 nanometer. And these optical filter, the idea of these filters is to block all the sunlight that also comes in. So especially when you use H rand 50 nanometer, you use this filter before or after your lens, and then you only get this portion of the sunlight in. Why do you use this optical filter? Because as said before, uh, photon shot noise is generated um, by the sunlight and it will really degrade the performance of your camera. So you try to put an as narrow band as possible filter there to collect as less sunlight as possible. And as you can already see here, there's a big benefit in using the 940 nanometer because the sunlight has kind of a, a notch here. So when you use this laser diode and this filter, you get in much less sunlight increasing the performance of your chip, uh, of, your, of your system, let's say it this way. Unfortunately, um, basically all the sensors that we have and also what we see in our competitors, they are based on silicon. Um, and the sensitivity of silicon is better at 850 nanometer than at 940 nanometer. Uh, still the benefit of lower sunlight here um, uh, in the end wins and dominates so that most modern cameras, I think, today are built with 940 nanometer because it just have better noise performance in the end. Of course, you could also use different lasers, maybe here at 1,400 nanometer, um, because there is really a big uh, notch of the sunlight. However, the issue here is that silicon um, is no longer sensitive to this, so your camera wouldn't, uh, your silicon-based um, 3D camera wouldn't work anymore here. Um, I heard there are approaches to use other materials like germanium, um, which uh, would provide better sensitivity here so that you can use then a laser here and collect much less sunlight. But of course, uh, silicon is, is cheap because um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the CMOS process is just dominating all the, the process development and so producing a silicon is much cheaper than in a different material. So that's why silicon, uh, maybe silicon germanium or, or different technologies for time of flight sensors are still kind of a, yeah, a future thing maybe, if they come at all. Yeah, I have two last slides of a topic that cannot be missed out or that we should not avoid here. Um, it's eye safety. As said, we have an active camera, we're illuminating the scene. Um, and the last thing anybody wants is that he uses face ID and suddenly is, is permanently blinded. What we have to consider is that these laser diodes which are used, they are really powerful. So for instance, a typical laser diode produces one watt continuous laser power from just 0.4 square millimeter source size. Um, this is a class four laser product. I'm just citing Wikipedia here. Class four is the highest and most dangerous class of laser. It can burn the skin or cause devastating and permanent eye damage. So this is what you have probably in your cell phone. And what, why is this still eye safe? Why can it be sold on the market? mainly due to two reasons. First thing is that such a measurement where the light is coming out typically takes just a millisecond, so it's very short and it's pulsed. And you have this diffuser that spreads the light to the scene. However, any fault either of the chip or of the diffuser could cause the laser light to go out really um, undiffused. And so um, most of the manufacturers really take care that also potential failures uh, somehow uh, mitigated or safety mechanisms are applied. 
uh, to, to cover these potential failures. Um, I would just want to give a br brief overview of what we typically have. So one thing is that uh, the current that flows into this laser diode is often monitored such that any shorts or anything that could cause the laser diode to be on permanently can be detected. Another thing is that um, customers often use photodiodes, so an additional external photodiode, which is placed underneath the diffuser because the diffuser is not perfect. It will also reflect back some of the laser light. And with this photodiode, you can measure this back reflected light. And if this back reflected light changes somehow, you could then detect errors or uh, faults of the diffuser. For instance, like diffuser has fell off, and nothing is reflected anymore, or a much a lot, a lot more light is reflected because somebody is holding his finger on the diffuser. This could be an issue then, for instance, for skin safety. So these things can be detected with a photodiode. Another thing that we saw is um, that the diffuser or lens or whatever is there is the last thing there is coated with indium tin oxide. Indium tin oxide is a is a material which which uh, is applied as a coating, and it's transparent. So the light goes through. Um, but it is also conductive. So basically you have a conductive but transparent layer on top of the diffuser. Um, and with this layer, you can then basically detect, let's say for instance, broken diffuser. If there is a crack through the diffuser, then the, the conductive, conductive material or layer is also interrupted and you can detect this, for instance, by, by monitoring either capacitance or resistive, resistance of this layer. Um, what is also standard, I think, is um, that you actually manufacture the, the diffuser that it cannot have a fault or that it's very unlikely that it has a fault, for instance, by using um, polycarbonate diffusers instead of glass diffusers, um, because they are practically unbreakable. Um, and then maybe on top, the uh, diffuser is glued on, but on top you add uh, a metal clamp that it really cannot fall off another measure. So uh, we really see that manufacturers are afraid of this and they are really taking care and, and developing safety mechanisms here uh, to make sure that this is really safe to customers. Okay, now that's more or less was my last, my, my last comment today. Thanks for your attention and if you have some questions, please go ahead.